Welcome to Mindful Ramadan 2022, Leaving a Legacy. This year, our goal is to inspire each of you to choose how you want to be remembered and ignite your passion for contribution, whether at home or on a global scale. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Hala Banani, founder of the Mindful Hearts Academy, my mentorship program where we help women become the absolute best versions of themselves in a loving and supportive community. Our guest today has a PhD in molecular pharmacology from the University of Houston, Texas, and has conducted PhD research for Texas Medical Center. He is a professor with research experience in clinical pharmacology, therapeutics, and pharmacokinetics. He has two patents in wound healing and 20 publications in international journals. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. We're excited to have Dr. Iyad Ghanabi today. We will be discussing sincerity in dawah. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. We are very excited to have you, not only because of, mashallah, what you offer, but you are one of Abdul Majid's dearest friends. We've had the pleasure of having you over in Egypt, and you hosted us in Jordan, and we had the most amazing experience, mashallah. So we cherish your friendship so much, mashallah. Same for me, alhamdulillah. It is all the mercy of Allah. One of the graces of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he surrounded me in my life yes. with very good friends, with great oh, wow. friends. Of course, Abdel Majid is one of the best of them, who uh, I can count probably on three fingers. He and two others. I'm the honored one, really, and it's for my pleasure. Jazakumullah khair. Wayyako. Mashallah, you have impacted the lives of millions of people. And as a professor, most individuals, most professors spend their time researching, publishing, maybe being driven to make more money. However, you have dedicated so much of your time in making series and episodes on YouTube. I want to know what drives you to spend so much time in doing dawah, mashallah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To start with, let me please, Sister Hala, ask the audience to pardon me for my broken English. It has been a long time. <laughs> since probably in the United States 20 years ago. I did, right. but now, most of the time, I'm speaking in Arabic. Alhamdulillah, right. I can give lectures in English, but for social life, it's not an easy task. But inshallah, as they say in Arabic, and don't ask me to translate this poem, it says, uh -huh. which means that when somebody says something out of his heart, inshallah, it will get through and influence the other party yeah. or the other person. Mashallah, so, uh, first of all, well, let me say that I would not describe your English as broken. It is, mashallah, very, you're intellectual and your words do penetrate the heart. So, jazakallah khairan for doing this. Inshallah, you will be seeing the broken English uh, <laughs> while we discuss, not, not a big problem, but I'm trying to right. overcome my uh, perfectionism in fact it is That's something great. that uh, i encourage the audience not to have perfectionism Mashallah. is the enemy of uh, progress what we call it, of progress, of progress. Of i'm so yes. glad you mentioned this because this is my message that so many people get caught up with being perfect whether they want to perfect their prayer they want to perfect a you know a book they're writing and then they never take action so jazakallah khairan for being so humble and so frank with us. And this is what the audience needs to hear, mashallah. Yes, and, and the other thing is about humbleness, in fact. Now, please, <laughs> anything that I'm saying, do not take it as Iyad was good in this and that. But wallahi, it is the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever I say today, yes. it is just a manifestation of Allah's mercy subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm not saying this out of humbleness, Again, why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, If you are grateful, mm -hmm. I will increase you in grace and increase the blessings upon you. So right. I am trying to maintain the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the mercies that I'm watching every day. And this mm -hmm. is why I have to say that whatever I'm saying, it is just by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah hides my many pitfalls and imperfections. May Allah forgive me for this. So, okay. Sassar Hali, we're asking about what drives me to do mm -hmm. uh, this da'wah job, right? Right, right. Okay. I, I want to know because you work so hard and you've produced, mashallah, so many videos and, and uh, publications. Okay. Now, I can summarize the driving force or the motivation probably in two words, which are pain and love. Mm. Love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his book, his religion, his messenger whom I have been reading about a lot. I and really loved Allah and His Messenger, alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. And pain from seeing disobedience to this God who, or this Rabb, this Lord, who I love. Disobedience to the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, whom I love. And the 
from seeing oppression and uh, transgression in this life. So these two forces, love and pain, I think have made many of the successes and uh, many changes in my life. Probably I can be accurate if I say that there is no story of success or accomplishment in my, in my life. Mm -hmm except that you will find the driving force behind it is love and pain. Well, it's interesting that you say that because from a psychological perspective, the two things that motivate us the most, the two forces, seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. You're seeking the pleasure of Allah, which makes it so much more profound, <clears throat> and avoiding pain, the pain of seeing that oppression. I'm so glad that you mentioned those two things. Yes, Please give I'd us like some examples. Give... Yes. Yeah, some examples. <clears throat> now, probably, one of the first examples was when I was about 14 years old. At mm -hmm. that time, my sister was in the College of Architecture. So sure. she was spending much time and sleepless nights drawing architectural plans and would go the second day to the university. There was a non-Muslim professor who was known to be uh, rude with the women or with the students who were wearing hijab, while lenient and very nice with those who do not. And I remember my sister when she came one day very sad and frustrated because the, that professor very easily with a red pen, he made some notes here and there on the architectural plan and said, you have to repeat all of that. Mm. He would not do the same thing with a student. Non-hijabi. So I remember that moment and I remember how I had this feeling deep in my heart that inshallah one day I will work for this day when I become a university professor just for everybody, nice for everybody, and at the same time, providing a backing and the support for those uh, students, mm -hmm. males and females who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who are practicing Muslims, to feel that there is somebody behind them in the university who is supporting them. And alhamdulillah, this dream has uh, been accomplished. Uh, I worked hard for that. And alhamdulillah, now yes, I have very good relationship with my students, all the students, alhamdulillah. And Inshallah. I think the pain that I had for my sister, the love for her, and the love for those Muslims who are practicing the, and, and, and are abiding by the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala impelled me mm -hmm. and uh, forced me or that has driven me to accomplish this accomplishment, to be Mashallah. a professor. Be professor. I think that's amazing that at the age of 14, you were inspired to take action. You took your sister's pain and it drove you to want to make a difference. And, and that's all about like leaving a legacy is that we need to take action and you became a positive force. You took something that bothered your sister and you turned it into something very, mashallah, impactful. Was there another example that you wanted to share? Yes, I have plenty of examples, okay. by the way, but, okay, but uh, probably I can provide uh, two more examples. Sure. Okay, I remember one day uh, when I was coming back from university to uh, home, it was probably eight or nine o'clock in the night and uh, it was very calm at that time. The one who was sitting beside me in the bus was smoking. So I get I got bothered by smoking and I told him, can you put please out put the it out? Cigarette. Yes, mm -hmm. he put it out and then he turned his face to me and said, speak to me. I said, sorry, speak to me, try to guide me, try to guide me. Mm -hmm. It was a great chance that somebody, this great moment of calmness is saying, try to guide me. Say something mm. about Allah to me, about Islam to me. This is what he wanted to say. Right. So I tried my best and was trying to fish for ideas and verses mm -hmm. and a hadith from here and there in my brain. But I have to confess that it was not an easy task. I was not prepared for that moment. Mm -hmm. So uh, I said what I could say at that time. But then I left. I uh, went down from the bus with pain that... Had I been prepared for this moment mm. more than I was, it would have been, it would have made a, a great change in the, in the life of this young man. So this forced me and encouraged me to memorize more hadith, memorize more mm. ayah, to memorize more uh, sayings of the Sahaba, عنهم, to be prepared for such a moment that can mm. influence the life of, of, a, of a person. So this is a second example. Mashallah. Well, that experience made you feel that you have to prepare for the unexpected. So you wanted exactly. to memorize more verses, have hadith. So at any moment you can give that da'wah, which is so important. Exactly. And one last example. Mm -hmm. uh, when I went to the pharmacy school, I remember in the first year, one of the first lectures in pathophysiology, probably it was in the second semester, I'm not uh, sure. But I remember the professor of pathophysiology coming in and saying that, as you know, the human being started as a protozoan. 
which was in the sea, and it evolved mm-hmm. to this and that organism, which exited the, the water and blah, blah, blah. I felt that my religion is being offensed, that he's mm-hmm. saying something contradicting my beliefs, my Islam. But at the same time, I did not have something to say to him. If I would say that uh, this goes against the Quran, he may respond that, okay, so what? Uh, I'm mm-hmm. not sure how, how he uh, would have responded. So this pain that my religion is offended made me say in my heart that one day, inshallah, I will be standing in this position as a university professor, giving my students the best of science that mm. I can, and at the same time, helping them to glorify Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and see how this creation indicates the existence of a great, wise, all capable Lord. And alhamdulillah, again, yes. this alhamdulillah, I, I think this happened, alhamdulillah. Yani, my Allah. performance as a professor, alhamdulillah, I think it's very good. My students like the way I explain things to them. And even the recordings that I made, many students from other universities use these recordings because alhamdulillah, very good science. Right. And uh, by the way, I have uh, a site which is called Fix Pharma in, in which I publish many of my courses. Okay. or lectures in pharmacology, yes. therapeutics, clinical pharmacy, pharmacokinetics, and various... Uh, MashaAllah, I'm so glad you mentioned it. Fix as in F-I-X and then pharma, P-H-A-R-M-A, right? Exactly, dot net. Okay, dot net. Okay, yeah. everyone yes. should look this up because, MashaAllah, we need that. I think being in a situation where you paused, you took time to reflect on it. You didn't want to say something that is not supported. And you took action to be able to do dawah in a very complete way. That's very critical for us to do because sometimes people get excited and they want to just say something without the backing and it doesn't have the same impact. So may Allah reward you for having the intention and telling us what drives you in order to have this impact sincerity is paramount in everything that we do. In every book of Hadith, it starts with So how do we make sure that we have the correct intention? Because there are many people who are working hard, many people who are striving. And I get reminded of the Hadith of the Prophet And I remember the first time I heard this, I just shook and I didn't really understand it, that there will be three people who will be thrown in the hellfire and it's the scholar the one who memorized quran the one who a martyr one who gave in charity and so i just thought how how could someone who has dedicated their life to the dean be thrown into hellfire and then after 25 years of doing dawah in this field i realized that it really does boil down to sincerity because many people are doing the work but the sincerity may not be present so how can we make sure that we have that's sincerity, so our work is counted. I cannot say that I have the, the exact answer and that it, all the time you can tell if you yourself have the sincere intentions or not, but probably I can give some clues. First of all, we can link this question with the previous question. That uh, the answer, in my case, the answer of how to purify your intentions is again in love and pain. Mm. Then that when I love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I want, I want to defend his religion, I, I want to defend the Prophet والسلام, this obscures my ego. When I'm feeling pain about what's happening to Muslims around the world, this again obscures my own ego. And as much as I feel love and pain in this perspective, I think this helps you to be more sincere. This is one thing. The other thing mm-hmm. is probably, let me say something before all of that, mm-hmm. that I do not claim to be victorious in all battles with the shaitan. Mm-hmm. For sure, the shaitan tries to creep in every time and to spoil my intention. Mm-hmm. But alhamdulillah, I think there are some few things that help me in purifying my intention in many times at least. First of all, I do not regard this worldly life a one that is deserving, directing our intentions towards. Probably one thing that helped me in uh, giving the uh, dunya or the worldly life the proper volume and putting it in the proper perspective is a long lesson that persisted for 19 years, which is the disease of my father. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon him. My mm-hmm. father suffered from uh, Parkinson's disease and it mm-hmm. started from the first year of college. SubhanAllah. And my father was the one who, mashallah, was one who had the uh, great capabilities in several mm-hmm. aspects. But I saw him losing these capabilities, mm-hmm. losing uh, his power, losing his uh, even uh, cognition over years. And for me, this was shocking that what is the worth of these worldly pleasures if they are, can all be gone by a little change in one minute area of the brain. So this is not something that I have to work for. 
the dunya is not something that I would have to work for. I have to work for the everlasting life if I believe in it. Mm -hmm. So if I get the yaqeen, the certainty of the presence of the hereafter, it becomes really crazy to direct mm -hmm. my intention for this dunya. So this is one thing. The other thing is <coughs> it, probably sometimes we get obsessed by the idea of purification of our intentions to the extent that uh, we don't want to do anything because probably this is not with pure intentions and it will not be counted in my good deeds rather in the bad deeds. No. We should not mm -hmm. go to either uh, extreme, any either extreme. extreme. Yes. You know, I apologize to interrupt, but what you, right. what you were sharing about your father, I can relate to because my mother had ALS and for 10 years, I saw her lose every function. She could, became paralyzed. She got a feeding tube and the last year she even lost the ability to speak. And this really does put life into perspective when you realize exactly. that someone that she was described as a lioness and the optimistic, very capable woman, mashallah. And so focusing our intention on the akhirah and making sure that is what we need to work for is really important. Exactly. Khayna. And by the way, yani, may Allah have mercy upon your Ameen. mother and my father. Ha. Subhanallah, Ameen. this is one aspect of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you see how when somebody gets diseased, he himself, inshallah, this is for his good deeds and mm -hmm. uh, this will uh, clear him from the sins, inshallah. And yes. at the same time, it is a great lesson for the it people is. around him, a, a great lesson which cannot be compensated for by books and khutbahs, really. You're so, so right. Yeah. I learned more from my mom during the year of silence when she couldn't speak than I learned all my life with her. And it's just incredible how Allah teaches us these profound lessons through examples. Alhamdulillah. Exactly. And I remember one time I was taking my father to the hospital mm -hmm. and I told him, Dad, please keep in mind the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, in which he says, that لا يودن أهل العافية يوم القيامة لو أن جلودهم قرضت بالمقاريد لما يرون من ثواب أهل البلاء. On the day of judgment, those who were in good عافية uh, in, in good status in the dunya without many hardships mm -hmm. would will uh, wish that their uh, skin had been oh. taken off by مقاريد like uh, devices which uh, takes the, the oh, skin very harshly. Why? Because they will see how Allah سبحانه وتعالى deals with those who were suffering in the dunya mm -hmm. because when they see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may let them go into the jannah without punishment without uh, the hardships of the day of judgment how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises their status, status and their level in the in the jannah they would say oh Allah I wish I I had suffered more than this person so I told my father this this hadith mm -hmm. and I remember although he at that time he had uh, he had microphonia you know sister Hala one of no. the symptoms of Parkinson disease oh. after about 15, 16 years of Parkinson disease, right. my father started having the symptom of microphonia, which means he, uh, it's, it's very hard for him to say what he wants to say. Mm. And it's very hard for us to, to uh, understand. understand. Yes, my mom yeah. went through that. Yeah. Yeah, probably out of 100 words, I would understand a couple mm. or three, three words. Mm -hmm. So, but I remember at that time, my father said, Hada Azauna al Wahid. He said it uh, clearly, which means this is the only thing that makes me patient. This is the only thing that makes, makes me patient. Subhanallah. Yeah. You know, that's so powerful what you're saying that to remind us, because there's so many people listening in that are suffering. They have ailments. They are being tested. And it's very difficult at times because they're feeling the tension here in this dunya. But to be reminded that this is going to raise your status. And that's what really helped me to endure what I saw my mom go through because I knew she is being cleansed and she's being raised in status. And I said, I love my mom, but Allah loves her more. And so subhanAllah, when we can keep that in mind, that it is a mercy from Allah that we are being tested, subhanAllah. And there is an analogy I wanted to share about, you know, when the shaitan can attack us and I see our good deeds as precious gems, right? Diamonds, sapphires, pearls, and we're carrying it on a tray. So imagine a pile of gems and we're carrying, how carefully would we walk if we had this? We would not want to lose one gem. And the shaitan tries to come and trip us and push us and so we lose it. So that analogy really makes me want to walk very carefully with the things I do so that the shaitan does not take away any of those beautiful gems, inshallah. Oh, very nice analogy indeed, yes. Jazakallah khairan. A lot of times when we talk about legacy, 
it's usually the rich and famous. They want to leave a legacy. They want to leave a building. It's out of ego that they do this legacy. Now, our focus for this series is an akhara driven legacy. It's not because of our greatness. It's not that we just want to be remembered, but we want to do something for the sake of Allah. We want to affect the ummah in a positive way. So how can we do it? How can we Islamicize the idea of a legacy? So that it is not driven by our ego? Correct. Okay. Can I put it in a different way, by the way? Absolutely. That, yes. I, I think Islam fulfills our ego, okay. but in the correct way. Mm. Which means that I am not supposed to assimilate my ego into the main cause of Islam and forget about myself. I'm not, mm. I'm not supposed to do that. But in fact, Islam makes me fulfill my ego in the correct way so that it is everlasting. Which means that mm. when I am sincere in my intentions, it is for the benefit of myself. When I call others for Islam, it is for, for the benefit of myself. And this is why you will find more than one ayah in the Quran. For example, من اهتدى فإنما يهتدي لنفسه. Whoever is guided, it is for the benefit of himself. من عمل صالحا فلنفسه. Mm -hmm. Whoever does righteous deeds, it is for himself. So mm. subhanAllah, it is from the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in Islam, when you do anything good, it is for your good and for yes. the good of the humanity and right. for the hereafter, alhamdulillah. So for me, to Islamicize my intention is just about certainty that I believe in all of that. I believe in the Quran and the Sunnah and this is for my good in here and the hereafter. Mm. And subhanAllah, even the Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam said a great hadith which makes you uh, realize that uh, it is for your good even here in, in the dunya, in the worldly life, that the Rasul said, مَنِ الْتَمَّ سَرِضَ اللَّهِ بِسَخَطِ النَّاسِ رَضِي اللَّهُ عَنْهُ وَرْضَ عَنْهُ النَّاسِ Whoever seeks the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even if it makes people mad of you, or uh, unsatisfied with you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased mm. with him and will keep him or, or keep the, the bads of people away from him. Mm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will preserve him from the wrongdoings of the nas. On the other side, وَمَنْ إِلْتَمَ سَرِضَ النَّاسِ بِسَخَطِ اللَّهِ Whoever tries to please people, even mm -hmm. if it uh, makes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unhappy this with you. This pleases, yes. This pleases Allah. Even if this pleases right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah will leave him for the people. Mm. So if I have the certainty, then I know that by being sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by working for Allah's religion, I'm really serving myself for mm -hmm. this life and the hereafter. It's interesting because they, they, there's a saying that altruism is actually very selfish because when you do exactly. an altruistic act, you feel so amazingly empowered. You feel peaceful. You feel happy, just like a runner's high. When you run, you get that feeling of elation. When you give and you help others, you immediately make yourself feel better. And this is one of the things I do actually to help people get out of their depression or the feeling of anxiety. I get them to help others. And this exponentially affects their mood and affects their perspective. So thank you for reminding us of that. Thank you for saying that you help your patients by telling them that altruism helps them and they feel good when they do good deeds. Yes. Uh, but again, in Islam, as you know, Sister Hala, in Islam, this feeling is true, is based on the absolute truth that yes, you mm -hmm. are doing uh, good for yourself. While in somebody who does not believe in the hereafter, mm -hmm. it is hard to convince him in this way for a long time. Probably he will say, okay, I will feel good. Then what? Mm -hmm. I will die. So why to feel good in this short life? Mm -hmm. So Alhamdulillah in Islam, the altruism makes you feel good because you have to feel good. It is yes. uh, logical yes. to feel good. Right, right. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for uh, clarifying that. You have gone through some of the most challenging experiences that anyone can go through. And I want to just share this with the audience because many people are struggling right now and they have hardship and they feel that when they're tested, whether it's with loss of health, loss of wealth, whatever it is that they're going through, some people actually lose their faith. They become angry, astaghfirullah from Allah, from the, the trials that they go through. They, they stop praying, they stop trying. And yet what I notice with you is that these ex incidents, and the first incident was when you were, uh, you were a political prisoner for standing up against injustice and you got in prison for a year and a half. This was shortly after your twins were born. This was at a very difficult time. And I, I remember that call and both Abdul Majid and I were in tears and we were really concerned about how is this going to impact you? I would love for you to talk about it because 
as a mental health professional, I was really blown away by how you took something that was seemingly a, a very unfortunate Thank situation and you mashallah tabarakallah changed it so please and then there's another incident that i'll share after this which is mind-blowing as well so please tell us how was it that you took the situation of being imprisoned and not only did it not break you but it strengthened you alhamdulillah yes mashallah okay. tabarakallah the first thing to say is again it is a manifestation of allah's mercy why because I can see very clearly that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me a test that I can, that I can stand, that I can tolerate. Had Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given me a harder test, mm. I'm sure I could not have withstand it. So alhamdulillah, it's the mercy of Allah. Uh, as the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, وَإن الله إذا أحب قوم ابتلاهم إذا الحديث the Rasul said, mm. يبتل المرء على قدر إيماني. That the man or the human being is tested uh, in as much as of his faith. So it According is to Allah. his faith, yes. According so to it's, his faith, exactly. Yes, yes. Yes. So Alhamdulillah, this is the mercy of Allah. Now, what happened with me in the imprisonment, as you said, I was admonishing the wrongdoing in my country, and I uh, tried to support uh, my brothers and sisters in the other countries who are suffering mm. from uh, volume, from oppression, from wars. So I had to go through this uh, trial of imprisonment. In fact, the most thing that benefited me, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, is attachment to the Quran. Probably, mm. you know, Sister Hala, I memorize the Quran. I have this Sanad, which means that uh, I have uh, this chain of readers of the Quran, which ends Mashallah. up with the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. So uh, I was writing a list of uh, ayat mm. while reading the Quran and sometimes contemplating upon these ayat, reading them once and again to derive the patience from these ayat and remind myself of the hereafter and the wisdom of Allah mm. subhanahu wa ta'ala. I was also reading the books of Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn al-Qayyim, and uh, there is a great deal of talking about patience in these books. And one thing that helped me a lot, alhamdulillah, is understanding the position of slavery. Mm. Uh, me as Iyad, I'm just a slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and understanding the rank of lordship, understanding mm. what it means to be a slave of Allah, that I have, uh, there is no... Uh, no room to question Allah. There is, there's no there room is to no question. Room, that there is no room there's to no question room. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. لا he is not to yeah. be questioned about what he does. This is not just a blind faith mm -hmm. as in some other religions. Right. They say you have to believe. It is faith. Mm -hmm. Now, in our case, it is faith based on evidence. Mm -hmm. Based on mm -hmm. uh, endless evidences of Allah's knowledge, Allah's mercy. So, alhamdulillah, this helped me a lot. That there, there was... A great moment, and I believe mm -hmm. I remember that in the first imprisonment, it was a great moment when the door for questioning Allah's deeds was shut down. Mm -hmm. That okay, I have to turn to myself and ask myself in every cal every calamity, every hardship that I pass through, I have to ask myself, what should I do? Do not ask yourself why did Allah do that. You can ask mm -hmm. this question just uh, out of trying to see the facets or the, the forms of hikmah, of wisdom of Allah mm -hmm. subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm -hmm. But not to question or refuse mm -hmm. the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. So when I turned, when I shifted the focus from right. thinking in Allah's deeds to what should I do? What am I mm -hmm. supposed to do? Wallahi, this was a great moment. Subhanallah, mm -hmm. whenever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts me in a tribulation, in a trial, and I focus on what I should do, I see a great deal of barakah of mm. barakah, of futuhat, as they say. The blessings. Uh, blessings and the great things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts. As, and I think this is one form of reward from Allah. Mashallah. That you did what you are supposed to do. You thought yes. in the correct way. So see the blessing that I will give to you. So alhamdulillah, for example, I can, if you like, uh, yes. this is uh, like a general rule, but I can give a couple of examples about that. I would love yeah. that. Let me just uh, reflect on what you said because you have so many gems, mashallah, that you share with us. One, you said your connection with the Quran really sure. kept you strong throughout your time in the prison. And you realize what it means to be the slave of Allah. That means you do not question. It's not the right adab. It's not the right etiquette. And you know what I always say to my, my clients, I say, you and I do not have the audacity to say we know better than Allah but we imply that we know better when we're upset 
about our qadr, when we feel that I should not have gotten sick, I should not have been in prison, my family member should not have died, we are saying astaghfirullah that we know better than Allah and that's so dangerous for us to do. And you said, yeah. don't ask why, ask what is the wisdom? And that's a very critical turning point for you, mashallah. Exactly. What's the wisdom and what, what am I supposed to do? And what and am I supposed way, to do? Yes. Yeah. And I remember a great saying of uh, Muhammad Al-Tahir ibn Ashur, may Allah have mercy upon him. He's uh, one of the Mufassireen of the Quran, mm -hmm. the explainers of the Quran. Yes. He said, Man fawwad amrahu ila Allah, lam yitaqab tadbirahu. Whoever surrenders all of his affairs to Allah mm -hmm. would not go after uh, everything that Allah does. For example, if you mm -hmm. go to a surgeon and you know that this surgeon is a great one, he's the best surgeon. He right. has never failed in any surgery that he did. And he tells you that, okay, I know your disease. It's very simple, very easy. I will be doing the surgery for you. And then he uses this knife and starts uh, cutting, <laughs> and cutting, making an incision, right? Yes, making an incision. And just imagine that you are saying, oh, doctor, it is not in this place. I told you I have pain in that place. Mm -hmm. He would tell you that had not you said that you trust me, then please keep silent. Mm -hmm. Okay, he started making the incision and it went deep a little bit. Doctor, it should not be that deep. Please keep silent. You trusted me. <laughs> we really, we, we submit ourselves to good yes. doctors in our lives. Yes, so, you're right. And we don't question them because we know that, <laughs> as you know, right. you, you, you may be having pain in your hand due to some narrowing in uh, C1, C2 of your neck, for example. Right, So right. The, the doctor knows better than you. What mm -hmm. about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What about Allah? So when you surrender, when you believe there is a Lord, mm -hmm. when you uh, know and base your faith upon firm, very firm pillars mm -hmm. and uh, evidences, then you you do not have any room for questioning. And really, it's very awkward, very silly to question yes. Allah's deeds. Subhanallah. So, that was a powerful analogy. I love that because we all submit to what the doctors say, especially exactly. in our yeah. you know communities. And yet, we how, how dare we question Allah? We just need to surrender trust and have that yaqeen have the certainty that whatever is happening is for the best exactly and you asked me mm -hmm. about some examples of how yes. i turned the pain and the yes. love in, in prison okay now i remember i have been present in prison the two times by the way in the oh, first time i didn't know yeah, about the second time okay the second time which was in 2015 and the first time subhanallah yani it was a hard one and it's not an easy thing to be imprisoned for uh, a good cause like the one I had, alhamdulillah. But I remember how I started memorizing the ayah, the hadith mm. to calm myself. And it was as if the steadfast iyad is convincing the hesitant mm. or the fearful iyad. And started writing down my emotions, my responses, the dialogue, the, the internal dialogue that mm -hmm. I had. The, the monologue. monologue. Yeah. Started writing down the monologue. Mm -hmm. And subhanAllah, these writings, I benefited from them and starting mm -hmm. talking, started talking about them to the other brothers in the prison. Present. And it had great effect upon them. Mm -hmm. I wrote uh, several uh, poems. And I remember that uh, I uh, thought about uh, writing a book with the title of uh, The Volcano of Emotions, Burkan oh. Lawat, because Oh, it's that's like, powerful. Uh, yes, it's like emotions which burst all of a sudden. Right. So, alhamdulillah, these writings were the basis for uh, a book, or in fact, they were the main material of a book which I later published under the title of Husn al Dhani Billah, wow. Thinking Will of Allah. Mm. Even the title is attractive because everyone wants to think will of Allah subhanahu right, wa ta'ala. Right, right. So thinking will of Allah. Subhanallah, this book made a big difference in the lives of many people. Alhamdulillah, it has been downloaded more than a million times around uh, the world and from many sites. Masha it has Allah. been uh, printed and many people got the book, alhamdulillah. So made a big difference in the lives of many people. And many people say that, I, I was in a very bad situation, mm. a disaster situation, very frustrated. After reading the book, subhanAllah, I started enjoying my troubles, enjoying oh, my heart. You turned your pain into power. So whatever you were going through, you reflected on it, you started sharing, and then you compiled it into a book called Husna Then of Allah, and that is thinking the best of Allah. Is this translated into English? I hope it is. In fact, some brothers and sisters said that uh, we would love to uh, translate it. Okay. And I think we can just form a, a little team. By the way, Abd Fattah told me that my they, son. <laughs> probably a couple of months, yes, a couple of months yes. away ago, he told me that me and my uh, friends 
are reading the book and I translate Aww. some uh, bits and pieces from here and there for them. And they are very, very happy with it. So uh, probably, inshallah, we will get it translated soon, inshallah. We'll try to. I should say so, our yes, son, Abdul Fattah. Yeah. I remember you wrote a poem in prison as well. I think it was during Eid. It was after the Eid celebration. And you wrote a poem to your mother saying, do not ache for me that I am in prison. You not only accepted the qadr of Allah, because many people just say, alhamdulillah. Yeah, you know, I lost my job. Alhamdulillah. But they don't actually appreciate it they don't see the wisdom in it but you wrote a poem please describe that poem about uh mom don't be sad for me that i am in prison during this celebration yes uh, i probably can say a few verses from the poem please which will, uh, please yes. do yes but i cannot translate them it's not that's not okay very easy. I'll try, inshallah. <laughs> All right. I was saying, Ya Ummi, la ta'asay anni umdi a'yadiya fil asri, an as'a an ahya aidan fi kulli awani min umri. Oh, my mother, do not be sad that I am mm -hmm. spending my time in the prison. I am working for the moment where every day will be an eid for, mm. for me. Beautiful. Uh, then I was explaining that for me, it is a eid when I write something that will change the life of somebody else. Mashallah. Uh, it will be a eid when I uh, defend Islam, when I push uh, uh, shubha, or take a shubhaf out from the, the brains of the some doubts, of my brother. Right, the doubts, doubt, the removing yes, it doubts. Is aid for me. Oh. Yeah, it is aid for me when I convince a, a Muslim sister to wear hijab. It is aid mm. for me when I convince a son who is bad to his mother to go back for her and kiss her hand and be a bar, be a respectful for being her. Being righteous, being a righteous, righteous. son. Yes. Oh, that's so beautiful. It, yes. And by the way, about enjoying the, the trials and enjoying the hardships, Again, this is a grace from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I remember mm -hmm. that moment in the same occasion, the same right. present that he talked about, Sister Hala. When I was saying to a brother there in the jail, I was telling him, Alhamdulillah, I'm feeling patient. Alhamdulillah, I'm content mm. with the decree of Allah. Alhamdulillah. He said a few words which were amazing and shocking for me. He said, mm -hmm. Yad, I, it is okay to be patient mm -hmm. and to be pleased with Allah's decree, but I want you to go to a higher level, to enjoy mm. calamities, to enjoy oh, wow. the test of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Enjoy the, way, the he... calamity. You guys, I want yeah. you to take this in for a minute because there are many people in calamities. They're, they have calamities in their marriages. They have calamities with their children. They have calamities in their you know, finances. And they are really drowning. I would describe many of my clients, many of the people we know, drowning. And when you say not just to be patient, but to enjoy the calamity, could you please explain how a person can enjoy the calamities? Okay. Let me tell you first how that person was enjoying the calamity. By okay. The way. He he suffered more injustice than, than mine, and he spent about 12, year, 12 years in the jail. 12 years. And he faced very, very, very bad occasions or situations over there. So However, I still remember him, how he was spending all of his time either reading the Quran, reading good books, mm. sometimes kidding with the, his brothers in the prison. Right. And I, I remember him very well when standing in the, at night, uh, praying the Hajjud mm -hmm. and crying. Subhanallah. So subhanAllah, that person, when he said these words, they had great effect uh, on me because I saw how he enjoyed mm. his test. So if, in fact, this made me think, how should I enjoy the, the calamity? Before right. that uh, word and after it, I was writing a list of benefits from mm. uh, the test of uh, You wrote a hundred benefits of being in prison. And you know, I use this example for many of my clients who are struggling. And I use that, I say he was in prison and it was difficult. And yet you wrote a hundred, this is radical reframing. You reframed yeah. it. So please tell us what made you write that? And if you could share a few of the things on the list. In fact, uh, I still have the, the have table it? with me and I can send a, Please, uh, yes. an image of them for I you. I would yes. love that. Yes. In fact, many and uh, probably one of them is uh, the impact on my uh, family, my wife, my children, my brothers, uh, sister, that mm -hmm. uh, they made dua. They got closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mm -hmm. that even my nephews, my nieces were not indulged in this dunya but wanted to get closer to Allah Aww. because they love Iyad and they want Iyad to be uh, out of jail. <laughs> so many benefits, not just for me, but mm. even for people who are around me. 
one of the great benefits is that it increased my attachment to the Quran, memorizing the Quran, understanding the Quran. And by the way, many contemplations that I made inside the imprisonment. When I went out, I made a radio program mm -hmm. and called it, uh, or in fact, the producer of the of the program called it in this way or gave it this title. What does it mean? A purpose. Raya fi aya, a purpose in a verse. Uh -huh. Then I made three, uh, we made like a, a, a contest where mm -hmm. I ask people around the world, the brothers and sisters through Facebook and YouTube, that where do you find in the Quran this meaning? If mm. you are faced with this test, how can you respond from the Quran? If somebody says this wrong thing or this wrong idea to you, how can right. you respond back to him from the Quran? Oh, nice. Okay. So they have the thing, proof. They have the proof have to proof. support it. Okay. Yes. In this uh, contest, I'm trying to make people not just memorizing. I don't like to see children just memorizing and mm -hmm. that's all. No, try to tie or try to uh, use these verses or be make benefit from these verses in your daily life to mm -hmm. see how the Quran is really, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the right. Quran is a clarification for everything. Yes. So some of these questions, by the way, and this way of contemplation was also uh, started back from the imprisonment. So I mm -hmm. cannot really, I cannot count how many benefits and blessings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to me from this trial. In fact, when in the other imprisonment, in the second one, I remember how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it easy for me mm. or led my steps to be put beside another brother who was a doctor, by the way. And mm. I, just let me go back a little bit. Please, I yeah. was in one ward in the imprisonment. I was in, in, one, in one ward and I was okay in that ward. Mm -hmm. There were brothers who were educated <laughs> in that ward and we were sometimes talking, by the way, everyone is in his own self. Mm. It is a singular cell, but we can talk from uh, uh, little windows uh, like this. Oh, wow. And we go out uh, once a week uh, for a yard. Go outside. Yard. The, outside. Yeah, outside, yes. Right. So I remember I was okay in that uh, ward. I was happy with the brothers over there. One day, somebody came to me and said, Yeah, prepare your uh, luggage or your uh, belongings. Your, your belongings, belongings, right? You will be transferred to B1 to something like this, a certain ward. This was the worst place that I oh. would go for, for me. Why? Because there were some brothers and we know about their problem, their accusations, false accusations mm. that they were charged with. And we know that they were very simple. They do not have uh, religious education. Mm. So for me, it's like a one, one way conversation, uh, teaching, one conversation right. or, or uh. teaching. I would not mm. benefit from people around me. Right. I tried mm. to resist and say, no, I will stay here. No, you, you cannot stay here. They took me the other one. Subhanallah. Allah decreed that I will be put besides a doctor who's called Muhammad. He's mm -hmm. from Syria, by the way. Dr. Muhammad was a very ambitious young man, younger than me, and he uh, passed USMLE step one. He was dreaming to go to the United States and specialize in this and that. I've forgotten what. Before he was uh, in prison for false accusations. And by the way, after a few months, he uh, was charged out of the prison. But after long suffering, mm -hmm. he told me, about certain very, very tough moments that he passed through. And Brother Muhammad told me uh, that he started losing faith. Mm -hmm. That why should I be faced with all these tribulations, although I was a good person. I mm -hmm. was very good with my mother. My father passed away. May Allah have mercy upon him. But right. I was very good with my mother. I was going to the masjid. I was just going from the masjid to the to home, to university. Did not do anything wrong. Why should I pass through all of these tribulations? Right. So. I remember when Brother Muhammad said that to me, and, and by the way, he, he was one who loved Allah mm -hmm. and wanted to, to maintain his faith. He, he hated feeling like this. Right. Did not, did not take this an accusation to leave Islam. He, he, he needed to, to be close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right. in this very, very tough situation. But at the same time, he felt very bad. Why should I suffer mm. from all of that? Right. So at a certain moment, the shaitan tried to creep into my heart and say, Oh, yes. Why should a person like mm. Muhammad, who is very righteous, very good person to his mother, why mm -hmm. should he suffer all of that? I remember the, the golden rule that he had, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لا يسأل عما يفعل. Don't Allah ask. Don't, don't ask. Don't risk. Yes. It is your, your job to mm. try to help this young man. Yes. And if you do so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put barakah and blessing in your deeds, inshallah. Mm. So alhamdulillah, I called the brother Muhammad. Dr. Muhammad, come in. Uh, by the way, there was a little uh, hole between my cell and his cell as as wide as this one. But for me and him, it was great because oh. we can speak without. Uh, yeah. So, so I, I called him, Brother Muhammad, come in. I told him, 
دكتور محمد اي ويل توك تو هيم تو توك تو يو از اف يو ار نوت ا مسلم از اف يو ار ان اتيس اوكي اني ويل ستارت فروم ذا سكراتش فروم ذا فيرست بيرال جو اسلام ذا بيسكس ذا بيسكس فروم ذا بيزز Right. I will approve the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, some of his attributes subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right. Then I will talk about the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then we can go to these questions of uh, tribulations mm. and the mercy of Allah and why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decree all of this upon us. Okay. He said, okay, I agree. Mm. So what made me try to help this man is pain from seeing him in this case. And at the same time, love to Allah and his messenger in whom Dr. Muhammad started losing faith. So, Alhamdulillah, I sat with him every day for about an hour. Uh, and we continued for about a couple of weeks. I remember the 12th day, day 12, I called him, Dr. Muhammad, after what we said, did you restore your faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm. firmly? He said, Alhamdulillah, I think you are the best one who answered my questions. Uh, Although I, have, I still have some. Okay. I said, okay, you have some, but did we succeed in basing your faith on right. hard pillars? I used to use with him this analogy of if you have a firm table, yeah. which is based on uh, on thick pillars, mm -hmm. thick uh, limbs, then right. the, the table legs. can the legs of the legs, table, the legs, right? Yeah, the legs on on thick legs, right? The table can withstand and mm -hmm. bear some little sticks which are called chubuhat or doubts. Doubts, right? But if you have a weakness in the mm -hmm. legs of your table, even a little stick can make your table of faith fall down. Mm, that's a powerful so I ask analogy. Him, yeah. So I ask him this question: Do you does your uh, faith withstand these questions? so that you can search for them, but without adapting your faith according to the answers of these questions. He mm -hmm. said, yes, Alhamdulillah, I do. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. After 12 lessons on yes, building the foundation of his beliefs, he regained his faith. MashaAllah. Alhamdulillah. And I can tell you that while preparing these lessons with him, yes. uh, I had this great emotion, very strong emotion of trying to help this young man. Mm. So Alhamdulillah, inshallah, yani, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it was with good intention. I remember that Muhammad was discharged out of the prison mm -hmm. and I took this material to another ward when I was taking to another ward and gave these same lessons to other brothers and it, it impacted them. And as I say all the time that talking about al-haqaq al-kubra, the, 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 the largest or the, 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 the most important uh, truth mm -hmm. is not only important for people who are in doubt, Right. Even for people who have the strongest faith need to uh, hear things about the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the wisdom of Allah, the attributes of Allah. It helps right. him a lot subhanAllah. Absolutely. SubhanAllah. So I gave this material in several places in the prison. Mm -hmm. When I was discharged out of the prison in June, no, in May 2016, mm -hmm. one of my friends uh, called me and said, Iyad, as you know, now there is a wave of atheism mm -hmm. among the Muslim youngsters and young men. So right. uh, I came to know some brothers who organized a certain program mm -hmm. and they called it Sana'at uh, al-Muhawar, preparing the debater or mm -hmm. the dialoguer. Would you like to be a part of the program? Help us in the program? I told him, he's, uh, by the way, he's a psychiatrist also or a oh, psych psychotherapist, Dr. Oh, Abdurrahman. psychotherapist, okay. A psychotherapist. I told him, Abdurrahman, uh, for the time being, my Islamic knowledge is like bits and pieces. Mosaic. I would mm -hmm. like to order the information in my brain first uh, so I can be a student in your program and then inshallah I can help. Alhamdulillah, I joined the program and Mashallah. I graduated as the first in Jordan. Alhamdulillah. Mashallah, that's amazing. And then uh, shortly after that, I started my series, which is called The Journey of Certainty. The Journey of Certainty. Where now, can people find that? It is on the, uh, in the, on the net and translated, alhamdulillah. Okay. And it's trying to help me in uh, saying the okay. episodes in English, not just having a subtitle. That's amazing. Yeah. Journey of, of certainty. certainty. Yes, okay. on Dr. Iyad Global Channel, Dr. Okay. Iyad Tunaibi Global Channel. Uh -huh. uh, most of the series is translated and Mashallah. all of the series of women, women in depth is translated, alhamdulillah, and many episodes. Mashallah. So I remember how, subhanAllah, in the first uh, episode, of this journey of certainty, I use the same analogy that I use with Dr. Muhammad. The that analogy Muslim of the table, analogy, right? Yes. Uh -huh. yes, the table, yes. yes. That now we are here in this series to build mm. our faith on strong pillars so that right. even if you have questions, no problem, you have right. the questions, but you search for them with, color, with the calmness and tranquility mm. in your heart because you base your faith on strong pillars. 
Alhamdulillah, even the way I approach some points was uh, the same as the one that I use with Dr. Muhammad. Again, Subhanallah. So Allah again, prepared love, that for you. The Allah fact that you exactly. were... So exactly. Mm. Subhanallah, that the love I had for that brother, the love I had for Allah and his mm -hmm. messenger, who the brother started to lose faith in, yes. and the pain, the severe pain I had when I heard his stories, yes. were the motive for starting the journey of certainty. Masha Allah. So and Alhamdulillah, by the way, by the way, Alhamdulillah, now there are millions of views on the journey of certainty Allah. in Arabic. And Masha I keep Allah. receiving comments and messages from brothers and sisters saying that, Subhanallah, we lost faith at some point of time. And after watching your series of or some episodes of your series, Alhamdulillah, we came back into Islam much Masha. stronger than we were before. Masha Allah, Masha Allah. May Allah reward you for your effort and for your ability to really demonstrate the faith because it's easy to say tawakkul ala Allah, but to withstand the trials and tribulations, to be able to enjoy your calamities, to turn your pain into power. This, from a psychological perspective, it is astonishing mashallah tabarakallah and i'm so happy that um you're sharing these stories because what you have done is you were able to take an unfortunate event that you had to be in prison really demonstrates the verse in the quran that you may hate something but it's good for you you may love something that is bad for you Allah knows Allah you know. wa antum la yes. Allah. Wa exactly <laughs> so you you embraced thank you for sharing that but that's not the only test that's not the only trial that you withstood you went through one of the most difficult tests of losing your precious daughter Sarah Allah yarhamha <laughs> she was <laughs> She was a beautiful pious nur in her face and she was only 12 years old and she was diagnosed with cancer. And subhanAllah, the way that you and your family embrace this. And we've had many people during the pandemic lose their loved ones and they are really suffering. So I want you to tell us and share with us, how were you able to withstand this test and how were you able to use your faith and that love of Allah to be able to pass this test? First of all, again, it is a manifestation of Allah's mercy. Because the first scenario, just imagine that Iyad yeah, did not go through these previous mm. tribulations and tests of imprisonment and the death of my father and many things, other things. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I lose my daughter. I do not think I would have been uh, patient as mm. I was, alhamdulillah. So, so Allah prepared Allah's... you. Allah exactly. prepared you. The loss of your exactly. father, the lo going into prison, having to subhanallah like you had to reanalyze all of the pillars of faith in order to convince others that way i just get goosebumps it's like allah prepared you for the marathon that you exactly. had coming exactly and this is why by the way when we talk about accepting uh, allah's decree some people may feel anxious that okay allah may uh, test me so uh, he would have a, a bad imagination about the tests and that he will be very sad uh, very frustrated no that he's being punished a lot of times people think oh allah doesn't love me oh i'm being punished yes but another point is that some people or sometimes when we say that every believer mm -hmm. is exposed to being uh, tested we may feel this feeling of uh, anxiousness, mm -hmm. anxiety, feel that feeling of fear. Do not fear. Mm -hmm. Do not have this fear or anxiety. If you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly, mm -hmm. trust his wisdom, trust his knowledge, trust his mercy fully, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test you in as much as you, you can, can handle. Tolerate. Allah does Only not burden you with more no. than you can handle. That, that's no, yes. an important message for all of you who are tuning in right now. Whatever it is you're going through, the hardship, the sadness, the trials, Allah knows that you can handle it. So that's always exactly. reassuring. Exactly. I remember, yes. by the way, Sarah was diagnosed with the cancer 17 days after I started the, the journey of certainty. Mm -hmm. And for someone who did not pass through the previous tribulations, he may ask himself, I am defending the religion of Allah, yes. and yet Allah is testing me in my precious, pretty, beloved daughter. Mm -hmm. Why? Mm -hmm. But Alhamdulillah, this question did not hit in at Masha all because Allah. I understand fully, very deeply, yes. that if you work for the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you are a good uh, slave of Allah, all what is guaranteed and all what you have to expect from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is that He will be with you, mm -hmm. with you, even if He tests you. 
he will be with you, will make you patient. And if he does not, then it will be uh, due to wrongdoing from your own self, by the way. So subhanAllah, I continued the journey of certainty. Mm -hmm. And I can say that the two years in which Sarah suffered and we suffered with her were the most blessed years in terms of accomplishment, even in the journey of certainty. The most, most of the, the episodes of the journey were made in these two years. Oh, subhanAllah. Now, subhanAllah, the, the test that Sarah had was not an easy one at all. And I remember the moment when I knew that she had cancer. She was complaining from her leg. And I went for a couple of doctors. We made some uh, tahalil, some, some lab results, some uh, scans or x-ray. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing was evident at that time. So when her uh, knee was swollen, I made the MRI. When I went out of the center where we made the MRI, the idea of cancer was not there at all. I did not imagine at all that she had cancer. So I was taking the report out and just reading it and expecting that unknown cause, that some inflammation. Right. And I, I read the Ewing sarcoma, OMA, so we are talking about cancer. By the way, l later on, it was figured out that it was osteosarcoma, which is even worse than Ewing sarcoma. SubhanAllah. The first thing that hit my heart at that moment is the hadith of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam. Why did I memorize the hadith? Because subhanAllah, in the, it, Sarah was diagnosed with this, with the sarcoma in the 27th of Ramadan. Oh, subhanAllah. Uh, during Ramadan of that year, I was not satisfied with my worship to Allah. Mm. I know how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to me in my life, how Allah bestowed the uh, blessings upon me in my life. One like me should, when he stands in taraweeh, for example, should be focusing, should be uh, my heart with me. Uh, I mean, uh, khushu, having the khushu, having that. Khushu, having uh, the khushu. Right. Uh, I did not like my worship at mm -hmm. that uh, Ramadan. So subhanAllah, when I, when I uh, read also uh, Ewing Sarkoma, Right. The hadith that I memorize in that moment is the when the Prophet ﷺ said, "In al abda la tasbiq lahu al manzilat min Allah." A certain slave of Allah may be suitable for a certain layer or a certain mm. uh, rank Level? in the jannah. Oh, okay. Level that Allah subhanahu wa taala may have decreed for this slave that you should be in this level of jannah. Mm. But if the slave of Allah, if, if the Muslim does not get to that sure. level, right, by his own deeds, Allah may test mm. him in his money, in his, his sons, and his children, mm. uh, and make him patient, make him patient to lift him up to that rank. Mm -hmm. So I felt that this is what's happening with me, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I ask Allah, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not want to put Iyad in hellfire. Mm. Probably Allah wants Iyad to be in this level of Jannah, not in right. this level of Jannah. Right. So Iyad's deeds are not up to this level. Yeah. So Allah assisting him in Sarah and making him patient. Wallahi, I feel the tranquility yeah. in that moment. Subhanallah. Somebody may say that, okay, you feel the tranquility, but why should Allah punish this little girl for your sake? It's not punishment. No. It's not punishment. As Allah made me tranquil, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made me patient, He mm. made this little 11 years old girl patient, alhamdulillah. I could see the blessings of Allah upon Sarah. And I cannot say that this is from how I taught her. Wallahi, right. it is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we suffered for two years. In these two years, Alhamdulillah, right. I had the calmness and tranquility in my heart. Try to, to help Sarah mm -hmm. psychologically, religiously, right. uh, in all aspects I could. And uh, Alhamdulillah, I spent the last nine days with her. Oh. I did not go out of the hospital Sapan except for Allah. some taraweeh, for uh, Jum'ah prayer, and for some uh, exams at the, the university. But most of the time was with Sarah. And I was very interested, very keen that when my daughter dies, I want her to be having good thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, husnu mm. dhanni billah. Yes. So, subhanAllah, I had great moments with Sarah, especially Allah. the day before she died. And I remember when, my, mm. when I went for a nap and my brother woke me up and told me, Iyad, it seems like these are the last few breaths, so uh, make sure you are balanced and uh, wake up. Prepared. You got to Pre be prepared. It's prepared. And I saw her dying calmly because she was in semi-comatose state. She, uh, she did not go into coma, lung coma. No, uh, subhanAllah, right. a few hours before that, she was telling me, oh, dad, recite upon me some verses about the paradise Jannah. and how oh. great it is. She Although, by the way, by the way, Sarah, bef yani, subhanAllah, at the, the morning of the day, or right. let, let me tell you, she died on uh, Saturday's night, which means the, the night that separates Friday from Saturday. Right. Until Friday morning. Sarah 
did not imagine that she was dying, by the way. Mm. She was resisting the idea of uh, death. Alhamdulillah, she was patient. Mm -hmm. She never refused the decree of Allah Masha subhanahu wa ta'ala, but she did not imagine that she is in her way for dying. I remember that uh, Friday morning, she told me, Dad, uh, am I dying? Mm -hmm. I told her, Sarah, listen, nobody knows. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. But I can tell you one thing, that if you die, what is يعني, عند الله, what Allah has for you is much better than we mm. have for you. Yeah. So be glad and uh, calm. Rest assured. And, be rest assured and, yes. that whatever rest is prepared. Yes. In, in all cases. Beautiful. She kept silent, but alhamdulillah, a few hours after that, she said to me, oh, Baba, احكي لي آيات عن الجنة وحلاوتها. They recite upon me ayat verses about the Jannah, the paradise, and how, yes. how, how great the Jannah is. <laughs> <clears throat> so alhamdulillah when sarah died i saw her dying calmly Mashallah. without suffering alhamdulillah rabbil alameen <clears throat> and when we went to the grave site i thought that should i say something especially that one brother talked about death gave a speech so i said probably i don't have to give a speech but then i said no i will share with the brothers over there yes uh, some of what i i have seen with sarah yeah so and, i gave a talk for and and i i heard that talk and i'm just interrupting you because it is so powerful because millions of people were making da for Sarah. They were making da for you. And many people were heartbroken that their da was not answered. And I think that what you did at that burial, being able to stand there and comfort the people who were there at your daughter's funeral was just, it was unbelievable. Please share with us because that is just something that really demonstrates not just acceptance of Qadr, but the enjoyment of the calamity, subhanAllah. Please share what you said in that. Yes, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed me how merciful he is subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was with me. So mm -hmm. I want to keep the husn of one, the thinking will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I want to keep this, maintain this in the hearts right. of people around me, on the grave site. But I did not imagine that these few words that I said would be heard by millions of people because millions. one of my friends was videotaping or was uh, yeah. Maybe you're taping this right, this, recording this it. Yes, recording was recording this speech, and he published it on my uh, own Facebook page because uh -huh. he has the access to my right. to the admin administration. Subhanallah, the speech was heard by millions of people. Millions of people. Many of them said that this was an eye opener. It changed mm. the way we think in life totally. Alhamdulillah. Uh, to this day, subhanAllah, many people are still mentioning this speech. Just a couple of minutes, by the way, probably yes. two minutes and a half. Yes. But it influenced people a lot. So again, it is pain for my mm. daughter, which I loved so much, by the way. And it's, she's course. the most one who, who, is, who looks like me, who Aww. speaks like me. Probably the most who loved me, although Alhamdulillah, I have a great relationship with, with the, uh, the of others. Course. But, but subhanAllah, the pain for my daughter, I converted it into husnul dhan billah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah put a great blessing, great blessing in the, this little speech. So the take home message that I would like to say to my sisters right. and brothers who are listening to me is that do not have a moment's hesitation about that Allah is the merciful Allah is the wise subhanahu wa ta'ala just think of how to gain the pleasure of Allah in each trial and tribulation that you pass through wallahi wallahi the results are miraculous the results are more than you can imagine if you are sincere and if you have this certainty in Allah's uh, attributes that is very very powerful jazakallah khairan for sharing this because I'm sure Anyone going through a trial like that, I've, I had a friend that uh, lost her three-year-old child and it's, it, I, I saw the pain, the hurt, the, the devastation that happens and any loss and to be able to maintain your husnadan of Allah, thinking the best of Allah, not questioning and surrendering, that is truly remarkable. I would like to know how you want to be remembered. What is the legacy of Dr. Iyad Maybe, inshallah. Probably, if you ask me this question a few years ago, I would say mm -hmm. that I would love to be remembered in, uh, for example, the journey of certainty, because for me, this is the project mm -hmm. of my life. Mashallah. Or probably I would tell you that I would love that people remember me when they, uh, for example, watching this uh, series of videos yes. called Husmudani Billah. By the way, when Abu Najid visited me in Jordan, he uh -huh. brought to me an iPad as a gift. <laughs> and Zalla Khair, I use this gift uh -huh. uh, for recording uh, many many uh, episodes of the series of Husnul Dhan, or even all, by the way, all the, all the 
Was so maybe series? he shares in the ajr of all that you're Yarab. doing, mashallah. <laughs> uh, this series and another one which is called Nusratan al-Sharia, defending the Sharia, the Masha Sharia Allah. law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Amazing. So, uh, but if you ask me now, what would Iyad like people to remember him with the legacy? Probably it is the personality, which means, I, I don't mean my personality, but mm. being able to combine scientific success Yes. With religious success, being loving of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, forced and encouraged all the time by right. pain and love to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the most thing that I would love the, the Muslim people to imitate and Masha to uh, do like me in it. Trying to cover more than one aspect in life, not just being a doctor, mm -hmm. but a university professor, just being a father. This is all great. Yes. But Having this pain and let's say this motivation to do something for the Ummah, being eager to make people love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, his religion, his Quran, these emotions, this compilation, this combination is the thing that I would love to see the Muslim youngsters right. and the Muslim youth trying to imitate Iyadin. MashaAllah, I think it's a powerful testimony of your faith. And we thank you so much in your busy schedule to put time in doing this. And I'm sure that already you've impacted millions of people, maybe millions of more people be introduced to the amazing work that you do. And what impresses me is the fact that you walk the talk. And that's so critical for us in this day and age that we are true and we are authentic and we exemplify the character of the Prophet Sallallahu So Jazakallah khairan for your time. Anything that you could share about the friendship that you've had with Abdul Majid? I know that you both have impacted each other. Any anecdotes that you'd like to share? Hold Abdul on. Majid, I remember, for example, when one time I was going out of a restaurant and I did not abide by the traffic rules uh -huh. and a police came behind me mm. and stopped me. So he told me, where is your insurance? I did not have insurance at that time. Uh -oh. Okay, so sir, you have to go to the court at this and that date. Okay, I will go to the court. I saw Abdel Majid. We were seeing each other probably every few days, and if especially Saturdays. Probably Abdel Majid remembers when we were playing football or soccer. Uh -huh. And neither me nor him were good at all in soccer. It was very funny, but we were very joyful in that. So I remember when I saw Abdel Majid and told him that I'm thinking of telling the judge that I had the insurance mm -hmm. at home, but it was not with me. In fact, I, Alhamdulillah, I, I do not lie, but right. for me, this is a non-Muslim and I will be paying money, a lot of money for what? No. So is it okay if I do not, if I say that? Alhamdulillah, I consulted Abdul Majid because I feel that there is something wrong about it. At the same time, I do not want to pay this right. much of money. <laughs> right. uh, yeah. So Abdul Majid, you know, he's all the time smiling, but uh, yes, all of a sudden mashallah. he changed his features <laughs> and mm. they said very firmly, he had. Just imagine a Muslim like you with this long beard. If the judge knows that he, you are lying to him, mm. how can he accept an invitation to Islam from you mm. uh, one day? If you talk about Islam one day, how can you? How can he listen to you? Subhanallah, mm. in the moment I said, Wallahi, I will not lie. I will tell him the truth. <laughs> oh, good. I went good. to the court, by the way. I went right. to the court and the judge asked me, he said, if I drop one of the two penalties, would you mm. pay the other and make the insurance? I said, I will. And I, I really okay. did. Subhanallah. He, uh, uh, he canceled it, one he of canceled. the... Oh, that's nice. He canceled one of them for uh, not abiding by the traffic laws. But right. Yes, I, I had to pay for the insurance and I made the insurance after, after that. So, subhanallah, having good friends around you mm -hmm. uh, keeps you on the path. But being alone, especially in the West, Away from my family, the devil can easily get me astray. True. So True. I, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, reward Abdul Majid and oh, all of my Ameen. friends who were with me in Houston because Ameen. they had a great, great impact on me. MashaAllah. And had it not been for them, Iyad would have been a, a very different person. SubhanAllah. Jazakallah khairan for sharing such personal stories and inspiring us, motivating us. We are all so touched and may Allah reward you and put so much barakat in the work that you have done. And inshallah, it'll weigh so heavy on the scales. Jazakallah khairan for your time. Wa iyaakum barakallah fikum jazakum khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum wa barakatuh. This concludes this fascinating episode. Jazakallah khairan, Dr. Iyad Qunaybi 
for joining us for such an insightful discussion on leaving a legacy. We hope you're inspired and motivated to leave a positive and strong legacy for your family and the OMA. If you enjoyed this show, please share it with your friends and family. And remember to sign up for free to get the replay, summary notes, and be notified when we return for another episode of A Mindful Ramadan. And remember, if you're interested in overcoming your personal obstacles and becoming the absolute best version of yourself, join my mentorship program, the Mindful Hearts Academy, and be a part of our loving and supportive sisterhood. Go to halabanani.com under courses, the Mindful Hearts Academy. Jazakallah khairan for tuning in. Assalamu alaikum.